Well, good morning, everyone, and may I welcome everyone to the 11th Public Petitions Committee meeting 2015. I would remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones and electronic devices as they do interfere with the sound system. Uh, no apologies have been received to date. Uh, agenda item one is consideration of a continued petition. And so the first item of business is consideration of PE 1558 by John Tom on behalf of RNBCC Crayfish Committee, Ken D. Catchment on American Signal Crayfish. As previously agreed, the committee will be taking evidence today from the Scottish Environment Protection Agency and the Scottish Na Natural Heritage. Members have a note by the clerk, and may I welcome Dr. Scott Matheson uh, from the Scottish Environment Protection Agency and Professor Colin Breen from the Scottish National Heritage to the meeting today. Can I also welcome uh, Alec Ferguson, MSP, to the meeting, who has a constituency interest in this petition, and can I now invite Professor Bean to make a short opening statement, after which we will move to questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Convener. Um, I ex express my thanks to the committee for inviting myself and Scott to come and give evidence today. Uh, this will be a, a joint opening statement on behalf of SNH and, and SEPA. Invasive non-native species, or uh, INS, as I'll refer to them from now on, are considered to be the second most important reason for biodiversity loss globally, uh, after habitat loss and fragmentation. They are extremely damaging to our environment, and our economy and our health, and it cost Scotland as much as about £250 million annually. Uh, crayfish are highly invasive. Uh, as you've heard, they will be, they've been introduced to a number of water bodies, and where they do, uh, they have been introduced, uh, uh, they have uh, the potential to cause adverse impacts on aquatic ecology uh, and many of our freshwater habitats. To put this in context, though, the Convention on Biological Diversity places an emphasis on INS prevention measures on the basis that this is better than the cure. Once INS become established, their control or eradication can be technically challenging. It can be very expensive, and in some cases, it isn't even possible. Prevention is the least environmentally damaging option and can, with adequate resources, be applied to, to a greater or lesser extent across the whole spectrum of invasive species uh, threats. This principle is repeated in the, the Convention of Biological, uh, Bi Biological Diversity HA targets, the EU Biodiversity Strategy, the 2020 Challenge in Scotland's Biodiversity, and all of these give the greatest priority pre to prevention. The new EU regulation 1143 and INS, uh, introduces a statutory requirement on member states to ban the keeping, transport and sale of species of EU concern. Signal crayfish are one of those species being considered for listing, but priority is obviously going to be given to species which have yet to arrive or are at an early stage of their invasion. The Habitats Directive and the Water Framework Directive also require action to prevent the deterioration of vulnerable habitats and species. And Scotland is renowned for the quality of its rivers and its international responsibilities for freshwater pearl mussel, lamprey, Atlantic salmon. The spread of signal crayfish has the potential to cause adverse impacts on these interests, and this could affect our ability to meet the requirements of these directives. The top priority for signal crayfish is to prevent their spread to other catchments, and the distribution of signal crayfish, crayfish in Scotland is, is actually quite limited. Uh, in 2010, it was estimated that 174 kilometres of river length uh, were infested with signal crayfish. That is actually 0.1% of the river length in Scotland. They are, of course, present in some other lochs and ponds, Loch Ken being the reason we're here today. Uh, signal crayfish are, in most instances, unable to move between catchments. They are not great uh, uh, movers under their own right. Uh, they certainly don't move without the help of humans, largely, and it's vitally important to prevent a deliberate and accidental movement between catchments. SNH and Marine Scotland have considered several applications in the past for licences to trap signal crayfish in Loch Cairn. Uh, SNH now, with the Licence Authority, assesses all of these uh, licence applications objectively, and we have to weigh the benefits of trapping against the risk of encouraging, encouraging uh, further spread. If we allow a commercial crayfish fishery to develop in Scotland, there is a high risk of encouraging deliberate introductions of crayfish to other catchments. This is supported by evidence from elsewhere, where giving a commercial value to non-native crayfish has resulted in further introductions to previously uninvaded areas in a number of countries. 
Studies in Sweden and Spain have demonstrated that the establishment of crayfish fisheries has led to the increased dispersal of these animals to new areas, often to develop a new fishery in other waters. The policy position of the GB Non-Native Species Programme Board, of which the Scottish Government is a, is a member, is that there should be a presumption against the commercial exploitation of invasive non-native species. The only circumstances in which regulated authorities should permit the commercial exploitation is where ends are widely established and commercial exploitation is unlikely to jeopardise uh, the potential for future management prospects. In other words, it should not make the situation worse. So any proposal which creates a market incentive for people to introduce signal crayfish elsewhere in Scotland has that potential to make the situation worse. Trapping is regularly put forward as a solution to the crayfish problem, most often by individuals who wish to exploit populations in Loch Ken or elsewhere in Scotland, either for personal consumption or for sale. It is widely accepted, however, that trapping does not remove all life stages of crayfish uh, and is not effective as a method of eradication. But its high intensity trapping effort may reduce the numbers of large and particularly male crayfish uh, in some areas, the, the, the resulting compensatory growth uh, and production of uh, wild crayfish can mean that the, 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 uh, the benefits are lost. Where trapping is licensed in the UK, both the Environment Agency and CFAS admit that there are weaknesses in their own licensing system. The blanket ban on keeping live crayfish in Scotland is clearer and more enforceable than the postcode map of go and no-go areas in England, which allows live crayfish to be shipped into no-go areas for the catering trade. This led in 2013 to the tabling of a cross-party early day motion, uh, number 659, which called on the government to, and I quote, give urgent consideration to emulating Scottish biosecurity control measures in England and Wales, to review the 2004 crayfish bylaws and to ban the live transport and sale of alien crayfish species in England and Wales. Prevention is a top priority for tackling by, uh, the, the spread of signal crayfish between river catchments. The Check, Clean and Dry uh, campaign is a, a GB-wide biosecurity campaign to raise the awareness of water, to, of water sports enthusiasts to the risk of uh, non-native species introductions. These three simple hygiene steps have been shown to significantly reduce the risk of spreading invasive plants and animals between catchments on damp equipment. SEPA has been working uh, with a range of national water sports and fishing groups to promote Check, Clean and Dry across Scotland. And since 2012, over 380 fixed signs have been installed at key locations. More than 8,000 leaflets and posters have been distributed. And many of the partners now feature clean check, uh, clean, check, clean, dry on their websites and include biosecurity in their training programmes. SEPA has also just produced uh, a biosecurity pack for event organisers, endorsed by a range of water sports users. Both SNH and SEPA recognise the impact of the negative press about crayfish and Loch Ennis had in businesses that rely on visiting anglers. This year, we will begin a survey of angling catches uh, with a view to assessing the future viability of that fishery in Loch Ennis. One of the aims of this project will be to promote, to promote the opportunities that the area has to offer for visiting anglers. Together with the Forestry Commission and Friesen Galloway Council, SNH and SEPA are also proactively promoting alternative green tourism activities in the area. The Fries and Galloway Council has gathered ideas for ways to promote the landscape and the natural heritage of river decatchment and is due to submit a funding bid to the Heritage Lottery Fund this week. Uh, Nature-based tourism is worth £1.4 billion a year to Scotland's economy and supports 39,000 full-time equivalent jobs. Uh, field sports, including angling, contribute around a tenth of that total, about £136 million per annum. And local initiatives like the Galloway Kite Trail, Seven Stains, Dark Skies are already attracting new visitors to the area. As a licensing authority, SNH is open to discussing any proposals for the control of signal crayfish and lock in. However, these must address the risks of encouraging the spread of signal crayfish elsewhere. The top priority, as I've said, is for managing the threat of signal crayfish in Scotland, and it must be prevention of that spread. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bean, for that presentation. Recently, the Rural Affairs Committee, Climate Change and Environmental Committee, uh, completed work on biodiversity. And in a letter to the Environmental Minister, uh, following this work, the committee said, we are aware that not only are American signal crayfish highly destructive to local ecosystems, but their invasive nature means that they may become a national issue if effective and urgent steps are not taken. 
Do you agree with the Rural Affairs Climate Change and Environmental Committee that the invasive nature of American signal crayfish means they may become a national issue if effective and urgent steps are not taken? I think there's two ways to answer that. I think the first thing is to try and put the, the situation in context. And I mentioned in my opening statement, or our opening statement, that uh, 174 kilometres of waterways are infested by signal crayfish. That's equivalent to 0.1% of all of the waterways in Scotland. The situation is actually very small in Scotland when we compare that to other parts of the UK. Uh, to give you some other contextual data, uh, if you look at England, 11,246 kilometres out of 46,939 kilometres of waterway are infested. That is a real problem. Uh, the real issue in Scotland is to prevent the further spread of these animals. Because signal crayfish have relatively poor powers of dispersal, you may have heard there that signal crayfish uh, can get out of water, they can walk for miles and infest new catchments and new rivers and new lochs. That simply isn't the truth. The fact of the matter is, yes, signal crayfish can move out of waters and they can live on land for a short period of time. They cannot move far. They have limited, very limited powers of dispersal. And the reason why these animals appear in the situations that they do appear in, which is as far south as Loch Ken and as far north as the River Nairn in Scotland, is because people have moved them there. There is no clear pathway of natural invasion from signal crayfish. So the key issue here is to prevent the introduction of new populations. Once signal crayfish have been introduced into a water body, it is almost impossible to remove them. In sm very small water bodies and small ponds, for example, we've been able to try and eradicate these animals using biocides. Uh, and in that regard, Scotland is certainly a leader, not only in the UK, but in Europe, when it comes to the, numbers of, the number of uh, attempts we've made to eradicate crayfish from, from our waters. Once these crayfish are introduced into rivers or into large lochs, like, for example, Loch Ken, the prospect for eradication is nil. So the clear uh, driver here is to prevent these animals from being introduced in the first place. So whilst they are incredibly damaging where they occur, the real trick is to ensure that they don't get there in the first place. So the real problem then is actually managing people, not managing the animal. You gave a statistic there that there's 174 kilometres mm -hmm. uh, infested by, obviously, these invas invasive fish. How long has it taken to get to that, to that kind of length of time? Crayfish were first uh, recorded in Scotland in 1995, and uh, that was ironically in the, key, the, 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 the D system, the Kakrubitcher D, where Loch Ken is situated. They've undoubtedly been there for some time before that. I think that by the time people actually notice that crayfish are present, they've already been there for some time and are already established. So a conservative estimate would say that uh, they've probably been in the, the, the DKEN system since the 80s. Uh, yet still, in 2015, we are at 0.1% of our waterways and 174 kilometres of, of waterways. So we're not talking about an animal here which will spread at a, a fast rate of knots throughout Scotland. Uh, many parts of Scotland, I'm sure, are actually not particularly suitable for this animal anyway. But uh, that gives you an idea of you know, how quickly these, these animals spread. And a bit of context, I think, in relation to how fast the animal has been moving. So I mean, we, we, generally, uh, we, we generally pick up new populations, and maybe a new population in, in every year usually in a place which is far removed from the next possible source of, of, of infestation. So, for example, uh, last week, for example, we found there was a signal crayfish population that had been introduced to a small pond. I don't know if anybody you know, Coat Bridge, the Tarry Pond, um, in the middle of Coat Bridge. That was, that was last week. Um, these things occasionally come up. There was no near population to that. They couldn't have done that under their own steam. That population probably came from somewhere on the Clyde where the Upper Clyde, like the, the, the D system, is equally uh, uh, infested with these animals too. Okay. 
Angus. Yeah, <clears throat> just uh, good morning, uh, Professor uh, Dr Matheson. Um, just picking up on a point you made with regard to the situation in England, um, clearly it would seem that there's uh, a, a, a worse problem down there. Um, but I, I was just curious as to whether there's been any attempt uh, in England to commercially trap uh, American signal crayfish. Absolutely. There is a well-established commercial fishery for uh, crayfish in England. And in fact, that's where the Scottish populations will have come from, actually. Um, to give you the, base, the, the, the sort of baseline for that, uh, in fact, crayfish were introduced into England and Wales in the late 70s, early 80s. And in fact, they were encouraged to introduce crayfish by MAF at the time, the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries, as part of a diversification programme. But unfortunately, crayfish are a bit like the Steve McQueen of the, the, uh, the invertebrate world, and these things promptly escape. They are pretty good at burrowing out of things. And, uh, and of course, new populations were established, feral populations were established, and uh, they established in the wild. So, uh, there is a, a well, well established uh, crayfish industry uh, in England. Uh, it's managed uh, through different means in England. They have, as I mentioned in the opening statement, go and no go areas in England where they have a postcode system where uh, if you have crayfish in the postcode area, uh, and it's a set postcode area, it doesn't move, it hasn't moved since 1996, I believe, uh, then you are allowed to exploit crayfish for personal consumption. However, uh, there are several uh, gaps in that legislation. And in fact, if I uh, can make reference to uh, some comments from colleagues in CFAS, they said that the ILFA, which is the, is the, the legislation they use to control crayfish exploitation in England, has slowed down the spread. It hasn't stopped the spread, it has slowed down the spread. Um, and also, I, you know, I think that uh, there's, there's quite clearly uh, uh, an incentive for people who exploit that resource to maintain that resource and to increase its, its, uh, the increased fishing opportunities. And in fact, if you look at the websites for many of these crayfish companies, they actively look for new water bodies to exploit. These are the same people who uh, wish to exploit uh, lock in. David. Thank you, Convener, and good morning. Um, can you update the committee on the actions that have been taken as a result of the meeting held by Paul Wheelhouse in July last year, specifically what has been done to restore confidence in Loch Ken as a coarse fishing destination? Thank you very much. Are you talking about? Yes, yeah, so there were several points that came out of the... Well, good morning to the committee. Apologies, and thanks for the opportunity to address you. Um, there were several key points that came out of the Minister's meeting on the 31st of July. Uh, there was a proposal to take forward further work on the fishery and the status of the fishery in Loch Ken. There was a proposal to do further work on the population in Dalbiti with a view to introducing measures to control or address the problem there. And there was a suggestion for the promotion of biosecurity. There was also a a further suggestion that the Minister would take away the need to do further work promoting tourism and other activities in the area. And I can cover progress with the first three of those. I've not been involved with the Minister's commitment to tourism. Uh, the survey to assess the, the state's freshwater fish was really intended to assess the viability of the loch as a fishery and, and an opportunity to see whether the suggestions that the fishery was no longer viable were, were were supported by evidence. So we actually have in place now a project proposal for a survey of coarse fish using angler surveys and a potential fishing event. And that will both allow us to gather data and promote angling and biosecurity to the, the, the community there. And I'm able to say that uh, funding for that project to start this summer has been secured from both SEPA and SNH. So that's work that will be happening over the course of summer 2015. Uh, on the back of the Minister's meeting, there was also the development of a, a Heritage Lottery Fund bid uh, led by Dumfries and Galway Council. And I believe the, the bid is to be submitted at the end of this week. And uh, funding for that would start in 2017. So the, the fishery survey is a, a, an interim um, preparatory work towards that. And the 
proposal was that the, the, the bid, if successful, would help fund the setting up of a group to promote angling in Loch Ken and the catchment. Uh, also review the existing Loch Ken management plan and produce a fishery management plan, and that would be informed by the data from the, the citizen, citizen data that we'd hope to start collecting this year. Um, in relation to Dalbeatie Reservoir, SEPA uh, and Scottish Water have actually been working very closely to assess the feasibility of options and produce an action plan which should be completed within the next month. Uh, there's a view to initial measures being put in place in summer 2015 and speaking to local colleagues, there is discussion of the potential for eradication, uh, so the potential is there to, to isolate the reservoir and treat the, the population to remove it. So that's, that's a feasible uh, option in smaller water bodies, as Colin has uh, outlined, but also with a view to preventing their um, escape into the river, there's potential for what was described to me as a, a chain mail mesh net across the, the reservoir as one of the options that's being looked at. In relation to a survey around the WT Reservoir, the Galway Fisheries Trust have carried on surveying in the area to inform the decision process, and they undertook a survey, the last one was in late autumn 2014, and they didn't find any evidence of crayfish in the burn downstream of the reservoir. So it looks like they're still contained in the reservoir with potential to do something to, to treat that. Um, in relation to the promotion of biosecurity, um, the Check, Clean, Dry campaign that Colin outlined is, is the key GB uh, approach to this. So SEPA and SNH have been working nationally with a range of national water sports and fishing groups to promote that Check, Clean, Dry by security campaign across Scotland. Uh, I think Colin outlined that since November 2012, we've arranged for 380 signs at key locations, such as boat entry points and so on, and 8,000 leaflets and posters distributed. So to outline some of the partners who have been involved in that, uh, the Rivers and Fisheries Trust for Scotland, the Scottish Federation for Coast Anglers, Scottish Angling National Association, Scottish Canoe Association, the Royal Yachting Association with the Green Blue, and Triathlon Scotland. And then in the Dumfries and Galloway area, with a number of those partners and the three fishery trusts in the area, the Nith Catchment Fishery Trust, the River Annan Trust and the Galloway Fisheries Trust, We've been working to produce a biosecurity information pack for event organisers. That is ready, it's ready to launch, and we hope to launch that uh, in an event on Loch Ken to promote the guidance if possible in the area. There's actually a lot of additional uh, local work on inns and specifically on crayfish, which I have a long list and I'd be very happy to provide the details of that in a written response if that would be helpful. Thank you. That would be helpful, Mr. Matheson. Angus. Thanks, uh, Convener. You, you mentioned the uh, Check Clean Dry campaign, which uh, is obviously promoted by both your organisations. Um, however, the petitioner claims um, that it's not working or it won't work in its current form. Um, he states that uh, canoe boats and other small watercraft in the Ken D catchment have no facilities to carry out such a task at the end of the day, and no one is there to enforce it and a 16-inch by 20-inch sign every eight miles is not going to inform the public. Um, can you tell us what impact uh, the campaign is, is having uh, to date, especially uh, given the views of the petitioner uh, that it won't work uh, in its current form? I'm not aware of um, the monitoring that's been in place yet for the effectiveness of this. So this is at an early stage in launching this, this mm -hmm. campaign locally. And uh, an effective... Um, promotion campaign requires monitoring. So uh, if it would be helpful, I can work with local colleagues to identify what they propose to do to monitor the effectiveness. But I can certainly um, attest to the efforts they've been putting in to spread the message locally, both targeted on user groups and more generally as an awareness with the local community. Okay, well, it would be good if you could feedback. Sorry? It would be good if you could feedback any information. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have a number of questions on the Check, Clean and, Check, Clean and Dry campaign. Uh, is there any evidence that the spread in Scotland is other than accidental? For greyfish? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, actually. Um, there is one area in the, uh, one fishery in the, in the, the, uh, the east part of the country, actually not too far away from here, who introduced greyfish as a management tool uh, to kill what's called mortalities or morts in a fishery. 
uh, to prevent to help prevent uh, disease within a fishery as dead fish fall to the bottom of a pond so crayfish would come in and remove these things themselves. That's an example of a deliberate introduction. There was a deliberate introduction to um, to uh, uh, some farm ponds, uh, uh, or a garden pond, in fact, in the, the tea system. Uh, we, that's a, a, a situation where we tried to remove crayfish with biocide. Uh, there was a deliberate introduction to uh, a series of ponds in the North Est catchment uh, for consumption. Uh, that was a case which went to court and was, was uh, thrown out in a technicality. Uh, there was a deliberate introduction into the pond, the quarry pond in Balahulish. Uh, we can only assume that the introduction to the, uh, the Tarry pond that I explained earlier in, in, uh, in Coalbridge was also deliberate. Um, yes, I think these things are all deliberate. I don't think they're, I don't think they're actually accidental at all. So, so just tell me then what happens when they're found to be deliberate? Well, I think it's very difficult. Once the, it's, you can imagine how difficult it is to try and apprehend someone who's carrying crayfish around. You have to be there at the time. It only takes a couple of crayfish in a bucket and you throw them in. So unless the, uh, the police are there at the point of introduction, there's very little you can do about it. You can imagine that in, if, uh, in, in many water systems, once these things are in, they are in. The chances of removing them are slim to none in, in most occasions unless you could manipulate that pond in some way by draining it and removing those individual animals. The unfortunate thing about it is that uh, the crayfish, once they've been introduced, may take many years to become established. And you may not actually come across them until uh, the population, population is established and someone usually, usually a lot of these records come from anglers, anglers see them on the... On the, uh, on the, on the, on the uh, on the bank or, or in the shallow waters. So I, mean, I think the, the potential for accidental introductions are, are, are relatively slim, actually. I think that, uh, on balance, these things have been introduced deliberately. On a rating of 1 to 10, what, what, what would you consider to be the... the uh, but because of most infestation, would it be accidental or would it be deliberate? I, I would say it's about 9.9 .9 out of 10 deliberate and point one, point one accidental. If that is the case, then yeah. what, what are you doing to, to, to stop this from happening? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, I think the, the key thing here is about, uh, about awareness. Uh, we have, for example, run uh, several uh, uh, workshops and training events for uh, RAF staff, for SEPA staff, for SNH staff, for the, the police uh, to uh, highlight the dangers of introducing these things. There's lots of, uh, there's lots of signage for signal crayfish. There's lots of leaflets for signal crayfish. At the end of the day, that's really the key thing, is about awareness to prevent these things from being delivered. Trying to educate people as to the dangers of what the transport of these animals is and the fact there that once these things have been introduced, then in all likelihood they're there over the long term. And uh, in England, then, would you say it would be the same sort of percentage? It would be 9.9, .9 and, and would it be the same abroad? Would it be 9.9? .9? I can't speak for what happens south of the border. I mean, they, have, they have a very different... Well, the uh, reason I ask that question yeah. is, is that surely if, if, if there is more about accidental than prevention, then obviously they're doing something to, to stop that prevention. Is it something you can maybe find out and, and come back to the... To you can certainly on? take it away with me, yeah. Yeah. Mr Matheson. If I can um, perhaps add a little uh, detail to Colin's um, response on the, the awareness raising and so on. So Dumfries and Galloway is, is ahead of other parts of Scotland in having a, a regional invasive non-native species working group that's been working since 2010. Um, and it's, I think it's a model that other parts of Scotland might want to, to follow in due course as we start to think about how we tackle the range of invasive non-native species. And some of the work very specifically on signal crayfish has been uh, focused very much on um, targeting information that people need to know in relation to the legal status of crayfish and fishing. So after the Minister's meeting at the Cat Strand in uh, Fusion Galloway in July last year, there was a, a frequently asked questions leaflet produced by SEPA and SNH um, to help clarify the legal situation. That was then sent to all the people who attended the Strand 
And then it was also distributed quite widely through things like the uh, community newsletters in the Loch Ken area and so on. Um, on top of that, the uh, CEPA has been working with Police Scotland to translate the signal crayfish posters into a number of languages because eating signal crayfish is, is potentially something that people um, from, say, Eastern European countries may come here with a cultural uh, interest in. So trying to create something that, that is useful uh, for perhaps parts of the population are more interested traditionally in crayfish um, in languages that they would be able to understand more clearly, potentially. Okay, then. Mr right. McCaskill. What evidence, either from Scotland or anywhere around the world, is there that issuing licences for trapping would incentivise uh, people to move crayfish into new areas? Yeah, there's evidence from from, uh, from Europe, uh, from Sweden and from Spain, but the establishment of new licensed fisheries has led to the uh, the establishment of new unlicensed populations. And is that related to deliberately moving into for commercial gain? Absolutely. I think you know, there would be no, there would be no incentive otherwise to move signal crayfish from those fisheries to other water bodies unless you had planned to exploit them at some point. What about the suggestions that SEPA and SNH could support trapping on a not-for-profit basis if operators worked closely with organisations, if perhaps the market incentive was taken out of the trapping? Well, that's not certainly not the situation in England, as we've seen there, but there is a licensed fishery, yet crayfish are still found in new areas. So the, the English situation would suggest to you, even, even where, where these areas are, 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 are tightly controlled, uh, that new populations continually, continue to, uh, to appear. Um, I think that uh, if you were to think of the, the Loch Ken situation, that if there was a licensed fishery to become established in Loch Ken, then there are other populations relatively close to that which also have signal crayfish in them as well. Uh, would there be calls to establish a fishery in those as well? So, for example, I would, get, I would probably point towards the Upper Clyde. I mean, the Upper Clyde uh, has a particularly bad problem with signal crayfish. Uh, it's in the central belt. There are, you know, it's within touching distance of two of the, the biggest uh, uh, conurbations in the country. Uh, that would be incredibly difficult to control, I feel. If you believe then, Mr Bean, that licensing is not the answer, you know, what are you going to do then to, to, to help eradicate us? Well, I think this, this is the point of it. Once you can't eradicate them, I think that's a, that's a key point to get across. So the, the, the point I'm trying to get across is that our first objective must be to prevent these animals from being moved elsewhere in the first place. And now by creating a market for them, then we create the conditions which would uh, exacerbate or accelerate the spread of these animals to new areas. Um, I think that uh, we have, uh, through, I mentioned the, the, the biocide eradication treatments, uh, that we've uh, pioneered largely in Scotland. Uh, we've looked at a range of different uh, techniques for the eradication of or the control of crayfish. Certainly we thought eradication might have been a possibility in our, when they first arrived and we were younger and naive. That uh, Things like hand removal, electrofishing, trapping uh, may have offered the prospect of eradication, but quite clearly they don't offer the prospect of eradication. That's not to say that uh, through further developments that uh, eradication is an impossibility. There are other people who we work with in other parts of the UK, for example, are working on different strategies that we can possibly uh, use and expand into Scotland. So, for example, the use of, of poison baits, for example, uh, the targeting removal of animals at particular life stages where they might be more vulnerable when they're uh, molting or when they're carrying uh, eggs and young that type of approach. So we're always on the lookout for new techniques. We're at the forefront of trying to look for new techniques. There's a number of PhD programmes in, in Scotland which are uh, looking at the crayfish issue. We're looking at new ways of trying to 
rapidly identify where these animals can be found. So using, using very state-of-the-art type techniques like environmental DNA to try and give us a forewarning of where animals are so that we can move in and try and, uh, try and take action as quickly as we possibly can. Even when these animals aren't visible to, to, uh, to river users or anglers or whoever, so they can move in and actually try and target these, these uh, populations before they, become, they can become fully established. So I think it would be a mistake to feel that in Scotland we are doing nothing. I think that was uh, a view that was expressed in one uh, a submission to the, to, the, to the committee. There is a lot of work going on in Scotland, a lot of work going on with our other sister agencies in England, and also a lot of work going on in Europe as well. There is uh, no slacking insofar as uh, our endeavours to try and find ways of dealing with issues, this issue are concerned. It's not an issue of saying, well, we've put our hands up, we're going to forget about it and let everything slide. Jackson. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Sorry, there seem to me to be two aspects of the discussion that we're having this morning. One is a quite interesting discussion about the containment of uh, signal crayfish, and one is about the petition. Yeah. Uh, and we've had a very extended discussion about the first part and very little part of discussion about the second. Yeah. Um, I didn't know anything about this before the petitioner brought it to us. It's typical, I think, in the mm. petitions committee. We don't. I mean, we mm. get all manner of different subjects come to us and, and we just have to do our yeah. best to read through all the paperwork. But I have to say I'm bound to the conclusion there's been an awful lot of prevarication um, and that our strategy appears to be one that relies, at the end of the day, on signage leaflets and posters, mm. um, with lots of talk about everything else happening and lots of work and discussion and the like. I'm interested to know where you think, or what you think the prognosis is for the strategy that we are employing. Ten years from now, do you expect American signal crayfish to have colonised more waterways in Scotland or not? I I think the likelihood is yes, they will have done, and I think that the cause of that will be through human okay. movement. Can I ask about Sweden and Spain? Yes. Because you made reference to them, mm -hmm. where there has been a licensing mm -hmm. scheme, and you said that this led to the introduction into other uh, mm -hmm. waterways of the fish. Were licenses then granted for those additional waterways into which mm -hmm. that um, unofficial extension of the population was uh, furthered? I, I don't have that information in front of me, unfortunately. But I think so. Actually, you don't know whether, in fact, the granting of licences led to an expansion of the population, which led to further licences, which allowed for their commercial exploitation. Well, what I do know is that the granting of the granting of licences led to the expansion of new populations, which again, obviously, well, you don't know that. I'm sorry, with respect, you don't know that because you've accepted that without a licence regime in this country, 10 years from now, you expect the population to have extended itself as a consequence of no licence regime, but simply the casual uh, introduction of the population. So we have a situation in Sweden and Spain where there is a commercial licence, where the population has expanded, and you choose to attest that that is because a licence was granted. But you can't tell me that licences were subsequently granted for the commercial exploitation of those additional populations, in which case there would have been no commercial advantage in having done so. That's correct. On the basis of the information I have in front of me, yes. Thank you. Um, can I return to the petition itself? Um, because I thought you skated very quickly over what Mr McCaskill asked, which is the petitioner is asking why this isn't unsupportable on a licence on a not-for-profit basis, uh, where there is no commercial exploitation where all the proceeds that would be raised in Loch Ken, which is now deeply infested, mm -hmm. uh, would be used for the future scientific research and teaching and examination of the very issues that you're trying mm -hmm. to contain, um, and for the benefit, obviously, of the local community mm -hmm. as a result of, the, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the trapping of the and sale of the animals. Yeah. But on a not-for-profit basis, mm -hmm. where there is no commercial exploitation for commercial gain, where does your... I mean, I understand we don't want to see these things spread, um, but given that in Sweden and Spain you can't actually attest that mm -hmm. there is any evidence that there was further commercial gain as a result of these licences being granted, where is the evidence in your mind that says that a not-for-profit scheme is not an alternative which is worth considering? 
We didn't say we wouldn't consider it. We have also, we have always said. You did. To, you said to Mr. McCaskill, no, who asked no, the question, that we you have, ruled we it have, out. No, actually, and I think if, if we have obviously had a number of licence applications for Loch Ken, and what we have continually said to Loch Ken, in fact, in our last last, last licence application in March 2013, was that we would be happy to look at any application which you put forward, which was scientifically based and could provide good evidence and monitoring that, uh, that the crayfish population could be controlled. Well, that is it, what we have said to Yes, but that's not what he's saying. He's saying that, in fact, this could fund the very scientific research that seems to be rather meagre at the moment. Well, I don't accept that the scientific research is meagre. How much is being spent? Um, and I think that, uh, you know, that uh, it's, it's all, it's all uh, very... Well, I'm asking a question. How much is currently being spent? How much is currently being spent? I don't have that figure to hand. Well, how can you tell me then it's not meagre? Because I know the, <laughs> because I know the projects which are, which are ongoing and I know the... Well, uh, perhaps you could itemise them for the yeah. committee and yeah. let us know how much is currently being spent. Um, you see, I just feel that there seems to me to be a collective... And this is, I come across this just... And sometimes rightly, sometimes wrongly, but it's what I find a collective received wisdom which has a momentum all of its own. And I accept, you know, I'm wholly in support of not wanting to see these populations expand, but I'm not entirely clear in a place like Loch Ken where it is infested, why the not-for-profit solution that might fund additional research um, harvest that population inevitably leads to it happening elsewhere. But even if it, even if it did in relation to the Clyde, mm. I'm still not actually, what would be wrong with a not-for-profit harvesting operation in the Clyde if this, too, was raising funds which were exclusively deployed into future scientific research and teaching. I, I, I see a distinction in my own mind between that and the commercial exploitation for profit, which seems to be, I think, an incentive, although not one we can demonstrate internationally actually happened. Yeah. Now, and I would go back to go back to a situation in our own country, and we're going to look at the situation in England and Wales, where where it has been licensed. A bit not, but licensed on what basis? Licensed in terms of the uh, the, the uh, exploitation of crayfish for personal uh, consumption, for but not sale. for not for profit. No, for sale. The, uh, there's crayfish sold from England and Wales and exported to the continent. Yeah, but that's my point. That's for, that is commercial exploitation. Absolutely. I'm drawing a distinction between that and not-for-profit, where no profit could be generated from that. But who will actually carry out this, this work, this not-for-profit not work? I think if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, the petition, it mentions uh, 50 trappers and 130 full-time equivalent jobs or whatever. There is, there is, there's no business case associated with that. There's, there, you, there is no... There's, there's a finger in the air, frankly. Uh, what well, is it's the a end finger in the air, surely, in a sense of desperation, because absolutely nothing of any consequence has been attempted that has been successful otherwise. In Loch Ken. In Loch Ken. Because the chances of eradication of crayfish from Loch Ken are zero. Absolutely well, zero. Well, until there was an experimental trapping, there was not even any understanding of the population itself. Is that not correct? That's absolutely true. But we knew there was, there was, there was, uh, it was a substantial population. And how then do we know it's had no effect on the overall population? The trapping? Yeah. Well, we know from work elsewhere that uh, trapping oh. uh, does not. Uh, well, how do we in... know? We, we <laughs> there is evidence, there's, there's evidence from elsewhere that trapping does not result in the eradication of these programmes. In fact, some of the... Uh, well, some of the... Can I quote something from um, a Mr... Uh... Ribbons of the Galloway Fisheries Trust. The initial five-month research has indicated that a heavy trapping programme may be able to have a significant impact on the present crayfish population. Yes. Well, it, can have, it can have an impact. It can have an impact without eradication, though. Well, I didn't thing. say eradication. And what will happen then is that uh, as you remove the catchable, uh, the catchable stock, then you relieve things like the predation pressure, the competition, uh, competition pressure, and you have what's comp it's called compensatory growth. That means that the, the population will not be reduced. It means well, you have, you like have the, same, the same biomass of that animals, seems like a but more of them. That it's, sounds to me like a theory, not but a But it's fact. not a theory. It's been demonstrated for all species, such as pike, for example, as well, in pike eradication programmes. Part of the licence regime that, that whoever the trapper is has got to catch X, Y or Z per year, and you see the numbers diminishing. 
Is that not a form of managing the, 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 the crayfish? This, I mean, this, this goes back to my earlier point there about monitoring and how would you, how would you manage that fishery? And I said, remember that this is a fishery, this would be a fishery in perpetuity. Uh, until you, I think like everyone else, you, would, you, you probably uh, have a, a massive dent in the, uh, in the numbers of catchable size, largely adult animals, mm -hmm. but left with a population of, of smaller animals which are growing much faster, uh, which are still reproducing. Uh, so you end up with a situation where you have, maybe have a reduction in, as I say, a reduction in the, in the catchable component, but still the same problem and still the same damage, which uh, has been said has denuded uh, Loch Ken of all of its biodiversity. That's a, a, a statement which has, has, has never been uh, substantiated. Uh, the impact that it has on fisheries, we don't know what the impact is on fisheries, and that's one of the reasons why we have a fisheries project uh, uh, about to, to kick off. And if you look at the websites of many of the hotels around Loch Ken, plenty of photographs of people with large bags of fish. Fish are not missing from Loch Ken. Um, so, yes, I think there's undoubtedly crayfish will have an, had an impact. The scale of that impact is not clear. Uh, it's probably unlikely we'll ever know because crayfish have been in there for so long. What baseline might we use? But, uh, but I, th I think to, to, to simply say that to throw, to throw a bunch of crayfish traps in and that would solve the problem, I think, is, is, is frankly not true. It seems to me, Mr Bean, that you're saying that it's very unlikely that we'll ever eradicate crayfish. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you seem to be saying that you don't want to put anything in place that might perhaps manage it. So, John Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. The, mm -hmm. the issue, and I'll just follow on from Jackson Carlo, is the issue about the licensing. And it's the seem to be getting this confusion between commercial licensing of crayfisheries mm -hmm. or a licence because no one can actually catch or lift a crayfish, a signal crayfish, out of the water without mm -hmm. fear of prosecution if they get caught. Mm -hmm. uh, and hence the reason my, my understanding is that the petition is asking for a licence to be granted to allow people to remove the sig signal crayfish uh, from the waters uh, and trap those fish, not on a commercial basis, but on the basis of trying to hinder the population growth mm -hmm. of the signal crayfish in that area. Now, mm -hmm. what would be the problem of issuing a licence to allow individuals to go in and trap signal crayfish? Not on a commercial basis, but to trap them, to eradicate them from that, or try and eradicate them from that water course. Okay. Right, there's uh, already quite a lot of illegal crayfish fishing going on in Scotland, uh, including in Loch Ken. I think that uh, trapping to alleviate pressures on, say, for example, uh, areas of Loch Ken in the event of a fishing event or something like that, is something that we have discussed with Jamie Ribbons in the past in relation to, to Loch Ken. Uh, we have never closed the door on that. We think that... Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, any proposal to trap on a large scale in Loch Ken has to be part of uh, a rational management mm -hmm. programme. I don't think that, that that's, that's uh, an unreasonable stance to take, actually. I, what we would not support, though, is some gung-ho uh, invitation to uh, crayfish trappers around the UK and elsewhere to come and you know, exploit this in a, in a way which is not managed and is a way which will pro possibly end up uh, uh, causing more damage to Scotland PLC in terms of the, uh, creating a market which might accelerate the spread to new areas. Professor Bean, I don't think the petitioners actually looking to get other trappers from elsewhere in the UK to actually come into this stretch of water. I think what they're trying to do in this petition is protect the water that's there and to get a licence to be able to trap the, fish, the cray, signal crayfish that are there. And the, the issue you've raised there about, the, the, was it, to quote you, a rational management programme. Yeah. Uh, can SEPA and SNH not sit down with the individuals which you claim you have 
to actually work out a rational management programme to actually try and help uh, limit the spread of and growth of the signal crayfish population. No, yep. Yeah. Can I? Can I just? Can I just? Um, you won't actually have seen this yourself, but this is a, a letter from us to Mr. Tom, uh, which we sent on uh, following a meeting with him in March the fourth, two thousand and thirteen, in which we said, uh, if you allow me to quote, um, we discussed other licensing options, and SNH intimated that we'd be able to license a non-commercial project with a clear management aim which is supported with a clear scientific methodology. Such applications would also require a sound monitoring and evaluation element, as well, in being as, well as being fully biosecure. A less robust proposal runs considerable risk of, ex of expending considerable time and resource with little or no benefit to any party. Unfortunately, we know from bitter experience and considerable cost that intensive trapping of crayfish simply does not work as a means of crayfish control. Um, we went on to say, uh, towards the end of that, that uh, we hope that you find the information of useful. We would be happy to reconsider any application supported by a robust plan that takes into account the issues raised in this letter. As we discussed at a meeting, once you have developed a plan and have the personnel and any funding required in place, we would be happy to discuss this further with you. That doesn't sound to me as if we've been unreasonable to Mr Tom. The, just to go back, Professor Bean, you didn't once again, in response to a question by Jackson Carlo, you, when Jackson Carlo tried to press you on how much money was being spent in terms of academic research in this area, would it not be possible to work with the local individuals who want to eradicate signal crayfish to bring in that academic support? Because you said there, there's, uh, you disputed Mr Carlo's assertion that uh, there was very little money being spent in terms of academic research. Would it not be the, an issue in relation to providing the support from SNH and SEPA to allow the local community to carry out that monitoring programme in conjunction with yourselves and the academics who are currently you claim are currently involved in monitoring signal crayfish in Scotland? Yeah, well, first of all, I, mean, I think the PhDs that I referred to are all working on separate particular issues of, uh, of crayfish biology. And some of them have, uh, have worked in Loch Ken in the past. For example, Zara Gladman, I think, that uh, uh, the minister was. But uh, I, I think in terms of directing research monies towards uh, Loch Ken specifically or, or crayfish generally, Certainly, the SNH uh, did include signal crayfish as a species within the Species Action Framework, which ran from 2007 to 2012, where we spent a lot of uh, put a lot of resource into uh, the management and science of, of signal crayfish. Okay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think in terms of in terms of trying to uh, to provide support in terms of the science and a. Uh, uh, element of any management proposal for lock-in, of course, we would be able to, to, uh, to provide that science, if you like, that scientific support or that advice that would be required. That, that sounds hopeful that you can work with the local community to actually mm -hmm. provide that scientific support to allow some programme to take place. Can I widen this out, convener, because I'm rather concerned at the issues regarding, you mentioned in your opening statement about the 174 kilometres of waterways that are infected by signal crayfish, mm -hmm. and you said that was 0.1 per cent of the waterways in Scotland, mm -hmm. uh, compared to, and you used the comparison with England and Wales. But the, you then went on to talk about the Tarry Pond in Coat Bridge, mm -hmm. and you said that that was a deliberate introduction mm -hmm. of signal crayfish. Can you remind me, what are the enforcement powers of SNH and SEPA in relation to people who are seen to be breaching the uh, non-invasive species legislation? Yeah, it's, it's clearly set out in the Wildlife and Countries Act, which was uh, strengthened by the Wayne Act in 2012. Uh, and there's the, uh, I can't remember what the, the monetary penalties are or the custodial ones, but, but certainly uh, it's illegal to uh, introduce any animal to any uh, place out with its natural range. I don't think we could, anyone would argue that signal crayfish, which originate from North America, uh, are in any way within their natural range within the UK, Europe or Scotland. Professor Bain, in relation to the Tarry Pond, you made reference mm. to the police 
catching the individuals who introduced, introduced the signal crayfish into that pond. Is it the police that carry out the enforcement action, or is it NS, NS, sorry, SNH or SEPA that carry out the enforcement action? Because it's the, the police. It's the police. So it's the police that would need to sit there at the side of the pond mm -hmm. to either catch somebody introducing the signal crayfish or somebody trapping the signal crayfish mm -hmm. at the, when they started uh, carrying out fisheries act activities in that yeah. pond. Absolutely, yes. Could you remind us how the Tarry Pond incident and the signal crayfish was brought to your attention? It was brought to my attention by the local fishery trust. And the local fisheries trust monitor a number of ponds and a number of waterways around the North Lanarkshire area. The, uh, the Clyde River F uh, Foundation, uh, the fishery trust that I'm, I'm talking about in this regard, and they're carrying out a piece of work for SNH to try and put together a strategic uh, plan for invasive non-native species removal. So as a result of that, they've been looking at uh, uh, records uh, held by uh, the local rangers, the local councils and things like that as well and uh, it came to their attention there was a possibility that, that signal crayfish may have been uh, introduced to the Tarry Pond and they went and investigated that themselves and found signal crayfish at the Tarry Pond. So that was a, a me I'm assuming it was a member of public that went to the trust and informed them that signal crayfish were in that I, I think they suspected they were in that pond I, I would suspect it was probably a member of public went to the local countryside ranger and it came to the Fishery Trust through that means, and then they confirmed that it was the case. See, my concern is, Convener, that we have an incident like the Tarry Pond, which could be replicated a hundred times throughout Scotland, mm -hmm. uh, with trusts, individual trusts only being, their attention being drawn to it by a member of the public, actually mm -hmm. notifying the trust. So what you're saying is there's 174 kilometres of waterways contaminated. We know the... Uh, the can is contaminated, but we don't know what the, the full-scale contamination mm -hmm. of signal crayfish in Scotland may be. So what you're presenting to us in terms of 174 kilometres of waterways mm -hmm. and the other small locations that you've referred to may actually just be the tip of the iceberg, uh, because there may be other areas, and you kept on referring to the Upper Clyde, the you knew the Upper Clyde, is heavy infestation of signal crayfish. Mm -hmm. The Upper Clyde flows into the Clyde. It's mm -hmm. got the river course that actually runs through mm -hmm. the Clyde Valley. Uh, so mm -hmm. how do we curtail or eliminate the signal crayfish spread along the Clyde and potentially along every other water course that feeds off the Clyde mm -hmm. or into the Clyde? Yeah. Um, I think, first of all, I think you're, you're right. I think there's probably more populations there than we know about. Um, Insofar as the Clyde is concerned, um, I think the, the, the Clyde, it, there's, there is no prospect of removing crayfish from the Clyde. Um, there seems to be no real prospect, actually, of, of halting that spread. Uh, it's a very, very difficult thing to do, particularly the animals are moving downstream rather than upstream. And in fact, uh, we installed uh, the first of its type, a crayfish barrier, at the head of the Clyde in Clyde's Burn, uh, precisely to stop signal crayfish from moving from the head of the Clyde into the River Annan system. Now, having said that crayfish are poor powers of, poor, poor powers of dispersal, the reason that we used that approach there was because actually the upper reaches of the Clyde and the upper reaches of the Annan are actually connected through a system of field drains. So it's not as if they walked across the land that they actually could get there through a series of drains. So that was the logic to that. But going downstream, um, yes, I mean, the, uh, the, the sad fact of the matter is that these animals will be moving downstream, and they have done so since they were first found there in the late 90s too. Uh, and in fact, uh, treating uh, smaller ponds with biocide to eradicate crayfish is certainly a possibility. Tr using a biocide in a river, particularly a river the size of the Clyde, uh, is... No, no, it's not, it's, there's no starter. The other issue for me, convener, is really the issue about trying to protect our own indigenous species that are actually mm -hmm. in these waterways. And you, you mentioned earlier, uh, now we've tried to re well, the salmon have been uh, coming back up the Clyde mm -hmm. uh, with the signal crayfish uh, predation measure, measures. They were basically 
eradicate the salmon at the Upper Clyde, uh, and basically that could end the salmon population uh, coming into the Clyde or leaving the Clyde. We've also got a number of other uh, protected species. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, then you mentioned Coal Bridge. I know that uh, SWT have indicated that the, the third largest population of Great Crested Newts just sits outside uh, Coat Bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, if signal crayfish were to get into these watercourses and ponds, then that would be the eradication potentially of the Great Crested Newt in that yeah. area. What are NS SNH and SEPA doing to try and protect those species uh, if you're saying there is very little you can do to eradicate the signal crayfish? I think it's very difficult to identify specific actions to protect those areas other than to prevent their introduction. Um, you know, the areas that you've uh, described uh, for great crested newts and places like Art Kosh, I've got to say I'm not a great, great crested newt expert, but I would imagine that certainly crayfish getting into these systems would have an absolutely devastating impact on them. Um, I think that uh, these, these areas are monitored very, very regularly by SWT and others, and that uh, you know, that, uh, if crayfish were to enter these systems, then these are the sorts of areas that we would probably have a, quite a, a start on in terms of being able to act very quickly, but I would hope. Thank you, convener. No further questions. Mr Ferguson. Um, th thank you very much, convener. And, um, I'm very aware of time and will, will be as brief as I possibly can. I, I have a considerable sort of local vested interest in this because I live about 200 yards from the top of Loch Ken and as, um, this has been a, a growing issue ever since I moved to that part of the world in 1998. Um, I, I wonder if I could just put a little local perspective on this because um, Professor Bean said in his introduction that Scotland, uh, uh, he rightly said, Scotland is renowned for the quality of its rivers, and I absolutely accept that. But Loch Ken was for many, many years also renowned for the quality of its coarse fishing. And I laugh a little bit when I hear about initiatives to promote the opportunities for angling at Loch Ken, because for many, many years Loch Ken promoted itself. The, the hotels um, that were mentioned, uh, you only have to look at their guest books and their reservation books to see that fishermen have voted with their feet no longer to come to Loch Ken in anything like the numbers they did. And this is not because the fish are not there to catch. It's because as soon as their bait gets within a few inches of the, the bottom of the loch, where it needs to be to catch the fish, it gets taken by the signal crayfish. Um, they are so numerous that you basically uh, can, hard, can barely fish course fish in Loch Ken, and as I say, the hotel's reservation records will absolutely back that up. So what, what you have is a, or what has happened, is that you have a huge hole created in the local economy by the almost uncontrollable spread of this invasive species. And the, the, the problem from the local perspective, despite everything that we've heard about ongoing works and to, to look into this problem, is what, frankly one of complacency, because the, yes, there are leaflets and notice boards um, extolling the virtues of, of cleaning your equipment before you leave, uh, even if it's not just fishing. And, and that, that has been going, ongoing for some years. But despite everything we've heard, and I don't, I'm not questioning any of what we've heard, really, the fact is, and it is admitted, that the spread continues. So what we are looking at, is, I think, is that all the measures that we've heard about and that are being taken are simply delaying the inevitable. Even the barrier that was erected at the head of the Clyde, which I think I'm right in saying cost £50,000, okay. so it's a significant amount of preventative money. I think it is admitted that will simply delay the inevitable and, you know, hold back the spread of crayfish. Um, it was said they're not good movers. There are people who dispute that. A lot of people say they are, they are very good movers, that they can move up to two miles um, by night. But in, in, I, I am aware of time, and I'm aware that this will be an ongoing uh, issue for the committee. But I wonder if, when you're writing back to the committee, um, you could identify for us, if it would be helpful, because I would find it helpful, the number of examples where a biocidal solution has been used, um, because I think that would be useful, and I appreciate there's a, there's a scale issue in that, because some of the size of Loch Ken, it's almost certainly not going to be effective, but, but it would be good to know that. And I wonder if I could just ask, 
maybe by way of wrapping up my contribution, convener. When does an invasive species become an indigenous species? Because it seems to me an invasive species is something that ought to be able to be eradicated. And if it cannot be eradicated, it then becomes indigenous. And once we have an indigenous species, then I think it can be looked upon in a different way. Because I think there has to be a solution to this problem that involves, um, involves trapping, not necessarily commercialization. Um, it's admitted that they're not going to stop them. We cannot eradicate them, but they can surely be managed in a way that is not happening at the moment. That has to, at the moment, I think, involve trapping. Um, and if, if we would accept that this, this species is no longer invasive but indigenous, then I think we could look upon it in a different way. Finally, convener. Much has been made of the fact that this is a very small problem in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK. That suggests to me that, that because it's a, a comparatively small problem, we could have a much greater focus on it uh, in trying to find a solution because it is much easier to identify um, in its various locations. But it also seems to me that if there is genuine research going on into this, it, should be, it would be hugely logical to bring it together in a place like Loch Ken which is probably where the greatest population is, and then at least the local people, the local population, could see that, that the complacency I referred to earlier on uh, is not a reality. I'll leave it at that. Uh, probably a final question is, uh, both of your organisations are, are publicly funded, uh, and just following on from what Mr Ferguson said, said there, where in the, your priority list does the, the removal of this indigenous species uh, why? Well, <clears throat> the SNH's priorities are set by, by government themselves in our grant and aid letter. So, but uh, certainly in terms of invasive non natives, I mean, I set the context there that uh, it's clearly a major cause of biodiversity loss. Um, there's been plenty of examples where a radical action has, been, has, has taken place, not just for species which are uh, not native to Scotland or the UK, but also uh, situations where species have been introduced to other parts of Scotland to which they are not native. So, for example, hedgehogs in uh, the Western Isles. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of uh, resource being expended on uh, the invasives issue. Um, but, uh, so, but where it falls in the and you know, the, the list of priorities, if you like. I think everything nowadays is a priority, frankly. Um, but, uh, but we do expend a, a significant amount of resource in this area. Okay. Thank uh, you. I should have said invasive uh, species yeah. rather than indigenous species. Yeah. I apologise for that. Any further questions? No. Uh, can I now ask the committee to decide what action it wishes to take on this petition? Members have a note by the clerk suggesting a possible course of action. Uh, what are the members' views? You give your course of action, yes. Jackson? Yeah, I would very much like to reflect on everything I've heard today. I think there might be one or two more bits of information will come as a result of the discussion we've had. Um, and then to, at a subsequent meeting, give some thought to what actions we might be able to recommend or progress. Okay, then. Yep. Members agree then to reflect on... Uh, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, can I thank uh, Dr Masson and, and Professor Bean for their evidence session today and, and uh, I'll now suspend the, the meeting for a couple of minutes.
The next item of business is consideration of two new petitions. The, the committee will hear from the petitioners in each case. The first new petition is PE1563 by Doreen Goldie on behalf of Avon Bridge and Stanburn Community Council on sewage sludge, uh, sludge spreading. Uh, members have a note by the clerk and uh, a spice briefing. Uh, I'm aware that after the committee's papers were issued, a motion in the name of Margaret Mitchell and an amendment in the name of Angus MacDonald uh, have been put down. So can I welcome uh, petitioner Doreen Goldie uh, to the meeting? And she's accompanied by her colleague from the Community Council, Joe Hurst. And I now invite Ms Goldie to speak to her petition for no more than five minutes and to explain what her petition seeks, after which we will move to questions. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for allowing us to uh, further discuss our petition, uh, PE1563. Uh, we are basically seeking to greatly improve the overall management, the effective treatment and storage of sewage sludge, and ultimately its safe disposal. We are suggesting that this process be entirely contained and controlled by a responsible and accountable body. At present, we feel the system is failing. A reason for making this request has come about due to our first-hand experience over the last six years of um, continually raising this issue through our involvement with the community councils and with feedback from local residents raising their concerns and making complaints which are, in, in our opinion, justifiable. Due to the existing practices, we find the main failings in particular to be noxious odours uh, lasting for days, longer in some instances from spreading or stockpiling of this material, risks to human and animal health as a result of spreading this material. The environmental and biological impact of long-term use where it is not being adequately monitored. Contamination of watercourses and soils. Traffic movements are uncontrolled. Spillage of this material on public carriageways. Improper storage. Mobile licence flaws. Planning issues. Lack of planning issues. We would look to Scottish Government to adopt a comprehensive approach across Scotland for the treatment of sewage sludge to end the current inconsistencies and to ensure a controlled and uniform protection is in place for all inhabitants of Scotland. We further appreciate the issue of sewage sludge is an ever-increasing problem due to the continuing population growth. However, we believe there are better practices currently in use elsewhere in the UK and Europe that should be adopted so wet spreading can be avoided. If the practice continues as it is, then in a short space of time, we could well render some of our agricultural land chemically contaminated and in turn destroy some of our ecosystems. We are of the opinion the Scottish Government needs to adopt best practices as used satisfactorily elsewhere and serious investment into achieving a suitable and useful end product which, when properly treated and managed, has recognised beneficial uses. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Uh, I understand that since submitting your petition, co community representatives uh, may have met with the Scottish Government representatives. Is that correct? And uh, if so, how confident are you that your concerns are being taken forward? Uh, we have been to uh, attend a number of meetings with SEPA, Scottish Water, uh, Margaret Mitchell, um, and we are fairly confident that our concerns are now being recognised, although it has taken a considerable amount of time to get to the stage we are now at. Could I just add to that that it has been accepted by both Scottish Water and SEPA when we met on the 17th of March that there are inconsistencies in current legislation and that there are um, gaps between those organisations um, and the problems that we've highlighted um, 
result as a result of those sort of inconsistencies and the gaps between whose authority it is to deal with current problems and whether or not they have the le legislation or the necessary powers. And it's the lack of powers to um, manage the issues that we've been um, suffering from. Could I also sorry, make a point? Since we produced some information to Scottish Water, they did cease supplying the main contractor immediately with uh, the wet material. They are now supplying, we understand, dry pellet form, but the supplier is still obtaining this material. Uh, the contractor, rather, is still obtaining this material from other sources which are unrecognised and unmonitored. Questions? Angus? <laughs> um, thanks, Convener. I um, certainly appreciate the opportunity to, to contribute uh, as, as a local member covering uh, the Upper Braes area. Um, as, as members have heard uh, from uh, Doreen Goldie and Joe Hurst, this issue has been ongoing for some time, uh, six years, as we've heard, uh, and it's caused significant inconvenience uh, to many of, of the constituents in the Upper Braes area, uh, and it's been frustrating for everyone involved. Um, it's worth noting, I think, convener, that we're in this position thanks to an EU directive uh, a few years ago which banned the dumping of sewage sludge at sea. Uh, and whether or not you agree with uh, that directive, it's left us in the position uh, that we are now in. Um, now, I, and as, as uh, Ms Goldie and uh, Joe Hurst are aware, um, I and my staff in my constituency office have been working on this issue for some time, uh, and as recently as a week ago, uh, a week ago yesterday, I met with uh, senior Scottish Water officials to discuss the, the current situation. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that both Scottish Water, SEPA, and the Scottish Government have taken note of the, the inconvenience and the impact uh, the spreading of sludge has had on the local community. Uh, for example, if we, as we've just heard, Scottish Water uh, confirmed to me that sewage sludge has been directed away from Falkirk District, uh, and there's been no sludge to Jock Craig, for example, uh, for three to four months, and Scottish Water have stopped um, tankers delivering uh, there. Uh, however, there's one further problem that arose um, or came to light uh, following my, during my meeting with Scottish Water, which isn't covered by the petition, uh, and that's it would seem that food waste has been transported uh, to a lagoon at Jaw Craig, uh, at the Jaw Craig site, with 68 lorries a day uh, passing through. Uh, so it's not sewage uh, that's arriving on a daily basis, but it is uh, food waste. Uh, and I've asked SEPA to investigate that further, um, and we'll pick up on these points as well, that um, you know, further investigation is required. Um, coming back to the issue at hand, though, Convener, um, I agree with the petitioners that, that we must look for alternative methods of disposal uh, as adopted in other northern European countries. <coughs> in Sweden, uh, I believe, uh, for example, only 14% of sewage is spread on land and in the Netherlands, uh, incinerators, uh, the, the Netherlands incinerates uh, the vast majority of its sewage. Um, however, the, the percentage escapes me, but it's, it's significantly uh, higher than, uh, than it is in other countries in Northern Europe. Um, it's, it's pretty high, it's about 80%, I think. So I've actually been lobbying um, behind the scenes for an increase in capacity for incin incineration of sewage uh, and raised it in the chamber as recently as the 22nd of April. Uh, so I hope that, um, that that's covered in the sewage sludge review, which I'm told is due to be released in mid to, to late summer. Um, but could I, could I ask the, uh, the petitioners, um, I mean, clearly you've had a number of meetings with the Scottish Government. Have you made a formal submission to the sewage sludge review or, or have, you just, uh, have they just taken notes basically from the meetings? Do you want to? Well, we've actually only had one meeting with two representatives of the Scottish Government, one actual employee of the Scottish Government and one employee of SEPA that's currently on a year's secondment working with um, that person. And that was on the 17th of March when we were up at the SEPA offices in March in, in Stirling. So that's the only, the only actual meeting we have had with representatives from the, from the Scottish Government. We've indicated that we'd like to have a public meeting with them. We've indicated that we'd like to have further meetings with them. And we'd also like to be involved in the review. But as yet, we've heard nothing else from them. 
Okay, well, I think there will still be an opportunity for you to, to, to feed into that review. It, it opened on the 6th of March, but there's... Yeah, well, there's we'd still... like the opportunity to feed into the review, yes. I, I recall emailing your office asking for an invitation to be included, I think, in mm. the, the review process. Um, obviously, this is something that we would obviously be interested in. Uh, it seems to have been quite a slow process to actually get to the review stage, and mm. I hope that you would also take into account we are new to this. We have learned on the hop, as it were, over the past number of years how to try and uh, respond to a lot of... Uh, yeah, I've, I've unfortunately I've found that everything <laughs> is a slow process yeah. uh, when it comes to uh, try, trying to, to, to make changes to, to procedures or, or legislation. Um, presumably you've done some research yourselves with regard to um, alternative... Uh, alternatives, um, like for example, large-scale anaerobic digestion, mm -hmm. or indeed um, uh, incineration, um, would that be part of your submission? We, we could certainly um, yes. supply. There is a, a number of pieces of material uh, which is easily available to give background information on alternative methods of disposal. Um, the, what I would like to point out is. We recognise that there is beneficial uses to this material. The problem we have is the um, contractor who is carrying out this work is not being monitored adequately. So it wouldn't matter if it was another contractor. What you have in place at the moment is not working because you have Scottish Water involved, you have SEPA involved. Um, the planning department. So there's a breakdown between all these departments where one crosses over to pick up in the other area. The, there's no consistency there of an end product. And because there's these failings, it is being ex exploited to the detriment of, um, I would say, to uh, the, the soil and uh, the contamination which we believe is going on. I because it's not being adequately monitored. We keep coming back to this. Um, so that's what needs tackling. The other thing to add to that is that when we spoke to SEPA, they highlighted that they only have four officers dealing with the whole of Scotland and that they do not have the resources to either <laughs> sample or monitor. So therefore, they rely on the three main contractors they have throughout Scotland to do their own self-monitoring and they take they do their own self-sampling they submit that for chemical analysis and they submit that to SEPA and that is open to abuse so there are no records as to where their samples are taken from there are no records as to when their samples are taken there's no management of that process so therefore they can't be relied on because it's not independently tested so we would like to see all sewage treated to the same level throughout Scotland and treated at source, and then whatever product is decided upon, it's distributed directly by the one body that treats the sewage, which most sensibly may be Scottish Water, but yeah. you know that's not for us to dictate. But we've done, from the research that we've done, we just see that the transportation of this across you know, vast tracts of land um, by various different contractors, by subcontractors, is, is causing a huge detriment. It impacts on our transport system. It impacts um, in various different ways. So. Yeah, that's all for your comment. Um, and sorry, Convener, I know we're localising this, but... Um, uh, it's not from... just a localised problem no, no, in Falkirk. No, I mean, we are, we're, we're combined with nine different... Um, community councils now around our area that we know about, which includes Torwood and Larbert. It includes areas in Stirling. Um, it includes areas of Lanarkshire that we've been in touch with. That's, that's what we are aware of. We're, we're mm. volunteers. We do this in our own time. Yeah. We don't have you know, vast arrays of resources. But in discussing the issues with SEPA, we know they're experiencing this nationwide. There are issues in the Highlands and Islands. There are issues in the North East. There are issues in Dumfries. So that's what's come out of the discussions that we've had with SEPA to date. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, with regard to the meeting I had with Scottish Water a week ago yesterday, um, they are seriously considering taking all the, the management of, uh, of, of sewage in-house, in mm -hmm. um, which is uh, certainly good news. 
Um, and with regard to enforcement action, I think um, we'll shortly be seeing the, the benefits of the regulator reform bill that recently went through Parliament, um, and SEPA will have greater powers to, to, to use, uh, greater enforcement powers and fines uh, that they've never had before, which uh, will help to concentrate minds with some of the, some of the mm -hmm. operators who have um, practices which uh, deserve further scrutiny. I think is fair, the best way to put it. Okay, thank you. David. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, you mentioned earlier about dry pellet use. As somebody who comes from an area which is surrounded by farms and uh, the sludge is used in our area and the smell could be, and I appreciate where you're coming from, uh, horrendous at some times. Has the dry pellet use made a huge difference? Well, the, uh, at present, it's uh, probably not the benefit from that has probably not been so apparent because there has been stockpiles of wet sewage sludge that had to get removed quickly. Um, the problem we have as well, coming back to the sewage sludge um, and the stockpiles, it, it's not immediately dug in in some instances where it should be. That is one of the, the, um, the, the regulations where it should be immediately dug in. Um, the contractor has been allowed to leave it stockpiling or the farmers, in fact, are leaving it to stockpile. So it's sitting on the surface, open to the elements for weeks or months on end. Um, but coming back to the dry pellets, I can't say that there's been any noticeable difference no. in some of the areas no. because there's still some of this other material um, that is coming in from out with or other than Scottish water uh, from other sources. Um, so it's, uh, it's hard to tell, you know. Yeah. Um, We're not aware of any dry pellets that have been spread to date. We're not aware of any dry pellets that are in the area. Um, we're just aware of wet stockpiles and the wet slurry that's still being spread. <clears throat> any further questions? If there are no any further... Sorry, John. Sorry. Yeah, just to, uh, I know that you mentioned that you've been in touch with a number of community councils that live in the central belt as well, mm -hmm. and I know that there is uh, dumping of human waste uh, in certain particular areas near where I live, and th there's an internationally known uh, business that is frightened to report one of the landowners next door because of the, the impact they might have on their business if the people realised what was being dumped next door to them. So clearly there is an issue in terms of the, 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 how this waste is being disposed of. But can I ask, the, the meeting that you had with the Scottish Government official and the SEPA representative, was there any mention in relation to the review of consulting community councils throughout Scotland? Because clearly I'm, I'm a bit concerned that the review seems to sound as, as though it's an internal review rather than a public consultation review. Because I think that clearly that type of review, review should include in my view, the community councils uh, throughout Scotland being asked to make submission and others uh, of their concerns or issues that they face almost on a daily basis uh, with this uh, sewage sludge. Dumping. Yes, this has been a concern of ours because we have asked on more than one occasion that the community councils and members of the public who have shown great interest and yeah. who have had to endure this for a number of years be included in the review process because it's through them that we have been given all this information um, and we can present this to um, the people who can make the changes. Um, if you had had this odour emanating from the centre of Edinburgh, I can guarantee it wouldn't have been going on for six years. I think from um, our understanding is it's currently a closed review and it's not open right. to consultations with um, community councils throughout Scotland. That was a point that we raised in our meeting on the 17th and that's something that we have requested. And we persisted with that uh, with Margaret Mitchell and asked her to raise that on our behalf as well. And it was raised in the meeting that was held in Slamana last August with Angus MacDonald and we requested that, you know, we be allowed to make representation and other community councils be invited to do the same. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, could I ask the committee what it wishes to do with this petition? What action it would like to take? David? Committee, could we invite uh, Scottish Water and SEPA to give us evidence, please? 
Angus? I think that would be helpful, convener. Um, I don't know if that can be done before the summer recess, but clearly it would be helpful if it could be um, before the, the, the review is completed. John? Convener, could I suggest we write to the Scottish Government? Uh, because while it's useful to write to SEPA in Scottish Water, they're acting under instruction from the Scottish Government. Uh, and the question I'd like to ask the Scottish Government is why the decision was taken to have this as a closed review and it's not open for public consultation, because I do believe that any review of this nature has to take on board the concerns of communities throughout Scotland. And if it is a closed review, then any findings of that review will not truly reflect the experiences of the communities throughout, particularly central Scotland, uh, but much wider in relation to the impact of the uh, disposal of this material. Because when you look at the, the guidance in terms of how you can dispose of this material, then there's hardly an area in Scotland that has not been affected by heavy rainfall. And one of the conditions is you're not supposed to put this material on saturated ground. And clearly that's happening. So I would write, we'd request that we write to the Scottish Government to ask the, why this was a decision was taken to have this as a closed review and that any review should be full public consultation and time should be taken to consider the responses from the public and in particular community councils on this issue. Okay, a couple of points, uh, action points raised there uh, with regards to a meeting with Scottish Water and SEPA. We'll see if that's possible. Uh, before the summer recess. Uh, the second point was uh, raised by John Wilson that uh, we should be right to the Scottish Government uh, with regards to the public, public consultation should be part of this review. And uh, secondly, would it also be uh, that we could also ask the Scottish Government to take into uh, consideration the issues that have been raised by the petitioner here today? <coughs> Agree with that way forward, colleagues? Agreed. Thank you. Can I thank uh, Ms Hurst and, and Ms Goldie for your attendance today? Uh, we'll now suspend for a minute or two for a changeover. Uh, the second new petition is PE1564 by James Treasurer on behalf of Friends of the Great Glen on Saving Loch Ness and the Great Glen. Members have a note by the clerk and a spice briefing. And uh, can I welcome Petitioner James Treasurer to the meeting? And uh, I now invite Mr Treasurer to speak to his petition for no more than five minutes uh, to explain what his petition seeks and we will then move forward to questions. So, uh, good Mr. morning Treasurer. and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to, to speak to you. And can I give you my greetings from the, the Great Glen? I left it there this morning, and it's obviously a, a, a scenic area of international importance, absolutely stunning. And I represent a group called the Friends of the Great Glen, and we're a conservation and heritage group. And we're obviously concerned about the protection of amazingly beautiful landscapes. And we recognise that this is part of the world's most beautiful and scenic landscape. So our... Uh, I don't think you need any introduction to, to Loch Ness. So it's obviously probably the most famous uh, loch in the world. In limnological terms, it's a lake. So it's possibly, arguably, the most famous lake in the world. And uh, it's uh, part of the Great Glen, which extends for 60 miles. In the Gaelic, it's Glen Albion. 
So it's a glen of Scotland. So it's always had very special significance for the Scottish nation. And also, it's uh, of great international significance. Uh, it has more than one million visitors per annum. 200,000 of those are from overseas. And it's the premier tourist destination in the Highlands. So it's extremely important for the local economy. Our concern really is the, the, uh, the multitude of wind farm development that's being planned <coughs> and in the pipeline for the Great Glen area and the Loch Ness area with uh, over 500 turbines in the planning process for this area. And these are not our figures. This comes from the Scottish Natural Heritage website. I've shown the, the, the map from their, their website. And it also comes from Highland Council. So there's no dispute about the actual number of turbines. Uh, the distressing thing is not really just the, the wind turbines. Basically, because these are at remote locations, it's going to involve hundreds of miles of pylons to connect these to the national grid, hundreds of miles of access roads, a building of substations. So, in fact, it's going to be really a big industrial complex for about 30 miles on each side of the Great Glen. So we're extremely concerned about it and as to whether the planning protection adequately protects this area. Our evidence is that with the scale of development, it doesn't. You know, we think it's disproportionate to this kind of level of area. So what are we asking for? Really, we're looking for some form of protection. We're saying, firstly, that the current system, uh, through local government and in national terms, isn't protecting areas that undisputably are of international scenic importance. So this is a, Scotland's number, it's the second largest tourist destination in Scotland. So we're looking for some form of protection and we've suggested two aspects. One is a national scenic area and there are currently 40 in, in Scotland at the moment. And these were designated by Scottish Natural Heritage or perhaps leading to a classification of a World Heritage Site. And that obviously would have to be uh, supported by the Scottish Parliament, by Scottish Government, and we go to UNESCO with a suitable case to apply it as a World Heritage Site. So again, that would be a question of discussion and perhaps a longer term objective, but uh, our contention is that this is an incredibly beautiful area in terms of the geological process, the Great Glen Fault, it could qualify as a World Heritage Site. In terms of cultural development, if you look at the Caledonian Canal, which is an engineering masterpiece, that could also possibly qualify as a World Heritage Site. So our concern is with this level of development and really that if we don't, the Scottish Government, together with Highland Council, doesn't act in the next year to two years, I think it'll be too late to save the, the Great Glen as we know it. And I don't know if you recall a television programme four weeks ago, it was called Secret Britain, and there's nothing much secret about Loch Ness, but it showed a, a fantastic aerial shot down the Great Glen showing Loch Lochy, Loch Oich, right up to Loch Ness. It's an absolutely outstanding landscape, and I think that really speaks for itself, and that's what we want to conserve and preserve for the Scottish nation. Thank you, Mr Treasurer. Uh, Mr Treasurer, you're calling for the area to be designated as a national scenic area. Have you approached the Scottish Government with this request, and what response did you get? Well... I did actually approach Scottish Natural Heritage about the conservation of, uh, of the area and the planning applications, and they said it's a statutory role to play. I haven't actually approached Scottish Natural Heritage directly. I've only suggested this as one of two possible routes, or maybe there could be more. Maybe the members here might feel there might be other routes and other ways of, of tackling this issue. And uh, but it was a suggestion, perhaps, that this could be a national scenic area. Our contention is that national scenic areas get national protection. But this is actually an international scenic area that's known globally. This is part of Brand Scotland, the same as the Fourth Road Bridge, uh, Edinburgh Castle, and it's something that really sells Scotland internationally. I note from uh, your petition that comments were almost exclusively about wind farms rather than the designation of a national scenic area. Uh, in an application for world heritage status, would you say that this reflects people's motivation for supporting your petition? Well, I would say that it did actually get quite a lot of comments, over 500, 
And I would admit that two or three were quite colourful, and I think I like to be more kind of objective about these things, but a lot of people were very passionate. When you read these comments, they're obviously very passionate. We're not making any political statement, and I realise that some people in the comments made a political statement. We're saying that uh, it's not just a matter of emotion. This is part of the, the economy of Scotland, part of the image of Scotland, and I think we have to, to preserve uh, the Great Glen and Loch Ness as it is. Questions? John? Convener, just to, to ask Mr Treasurer, in terms of the last part of his petition, uh, what you've said here is, uh, and I understand the issue about the wind turbine developments, and support the restoration of sites damaged by wind turbines. Can you just expand on what you mean by the restoration of the sites damaged? Is that if would it be your view that if you did get national heritage status or international heritage status, would it be your view that you would wish, wish to see those turbines being removed? Well, I realise that some of these uh, applications are in process and obviously there's been developments built. I mean, I'm particularly thinking that uh, we as a country should perhaps be looking things in a different kind of way that we look at landscapes where planning permission has been given in the past for specific developments, but which are abs uh, perhaps, I take to use the term mutilate the Scottish landscape, but perhaps have not been put in the correct location. And I would put it very much the emphasis being on a, an ethical point of view to the developer. Would they be willing initially to remove particular turbines in particularly a uh, dominant landscapes. For example, turbines can be seen for 28 miles. So it's absolutely a, a large radius. So it's basically to say to the developers, can we remove these particular turbines? And this is why I gave the example in the photograph there, the second part of evidence from the A82. This particular development, which is four miles south of, of uh, Fort Augustus, can be seen from the A82. It's a main tourist route, and every single tourist coming up that route can see that development. And it's whether developments like that, perhaps the turbines should be removed. And perhaps as a country, we should be thinking of actually removing some of these current developments. Right. Thank Mr Treasurer for that response. Uh, just maybe following on from uh, turbines and tourists, do you, uh, do you believe then that turbine developments harm tourists in the area? And if so, what evidence do you have to support us? Well, can I make this clear? It's just not, as I mentioned before, it's not the turbines. It's uh, hundreds of miles of pylons. And you probably saw the, the article in the, the Sunday Times 10 days ago that 46% of Scotland can now be seen to uh, for energy structures. But in terms of tourism, obviously this is a major economy of the Highlands. A recent survey sponsored by the Scottish Government indicated that 20% of tourists would adversely be impacted by this and would not visit this area. This includes certain countries such as Canada, United States, Belgium and France that are adverse to, to, to wind farms. So a certain sector of the tourist economy would be damaged with, with very large and considerable impacts on the tourist industry. And obviously we are quite concerned about that. In terms of the Great Glen and uh, Loch Ness, it's difficult to gauge that at the moment because these de developments haven't been built. Only two wind uh, farms have been built at the moment, but once 500 uh, turbines are built in that, that area, tourists are passing through this. They can see it from every hill point uh, in the area. I think undoubtedly there's going to be an impact on tourism. And I would say, would common sense say that you put these developments in an area which is the Highlands number one tourist destination. It's totally inappropriate. Mr McCaskill? I, I fully concur that it's a, a bonnie area and we do have to cherish it. I'm interested, I mean, I think my limited understanding, the reason it's Glen Albin is that's where the Scots tribes came when they came across from Ireland, landed in Argyll and walked through uh, what is the Great Glen. Would you accept, though, that the topography has probably changed remarkably greatly since then, given the removal of the Caledonian rainforest, that things don't always remain static, even although the vista can be beautiful? Yeah, I, I would agree that the, the, the landscape can change, but what people come to Scotland to see is a natural landscape, a wild landscape. I take it our interpretation of a landscape can vary, and it's, it's very qualitative, our understanding of beauty. 
But I think everyone here can understand beauty. Uh, if you ask 100 people what is natural beauty, uh, 99 would say, and possibly you would agree, that the, the landscape of the area I'm speaking about is of outstanding natural beauty. They don't want to come to see something that is uh, industrial, that is artificial. They are looking for a wild landscape, a natural landscape. Just for clarification for myself, Mr Treasurer, did you say there was a Scottish Government report that had evidence to say that turbines were a distraction for tourists? No, it didn't say that. The report was actually a questionnaire some years ago, and I, th I think it wasn't really asked the right question. I think it, uh, for, for this particular area, you'd really have to ask tourists coming to this particular area once 500 turbines are in that area to say, what do you think of this? But the report was actually looking at the impact of wind farms on tourism. But uh, it did encapsulate that 20% of the respondents would not come to this area because of the, the disadvantage of seeing wind turbines. And many of the people come here to, to, to walk the, uh, the Great Glen Way, to kayak up, up Loch Ness, to see the, hill, the landscape from Loch Ness. And they're really looking for a, a natural landscape. Any further questions? If there are no further questions, can I ask the committee what action would like to take in this petition? Good idea for suggest that uh, the committee may wish to seek written views uh, for, for example, Highland Council, Scottish Narrative Heri Her Heritage, Scottish Renewables, John Muir Trust and the Scottish Government. Members agree? Um, Thank you. Convener, can I ask when you write to Highland Council, can you ask um, if they take into account for planning permission the cumulative effect of the number of wind turbines in the area? I know Fife Council did in the past when I was a councillor um, and refused planning applications on that. I think we could agree to ask that question. Members agreed? Can I thank you, Mr Treasurer, uh, uh, for giving your presentation and uh, I'll now suspend for a couple of minutes. The, the next item of business is consideration of seven continued petitions, and the first petition is PE1319 by William Smith and Scott Robertson on improving youth football in Scotland. Members have a note by the clerk and a submission from the Children's Commissioner and the colleagues. By way of opening comment, I would, uh, as I was not on the committee for the previous considerations of this petition, but I'm aware of the issues. I would like to put on record my thanks to the Commissioner for this report. Clearly, there are some serious and fundamental concerns around this process, and I very much hope that this committee will pursue these vigorously. 
Uh, can I invite contributions from the members? David. Um, convener, can I ask that um, we revisit this petition but um, after the debate that's in Parliament has been held? Especially, can I ask um, if we bring the, the Commissioner in to give us a, a report on its findings? Any other comments? Yeah, I think there is an issue here, and therefore it would be worth hearing from the Commissioner. It seems to me, from my limited experience in this, it's not simply the, it's not simply the release of the young person from the contract. It's the period of time that they can or should be retained. And certainly in the Netherlands, if you sign a youngster at an elite level, then you're obliged to keep them, not discard them. Uh, and therefore, I think, you know, hearing from the Commissioner and indeed hearing the wider debate would address matters because I think it's slightly wider than simply being able to get out the contract and the reward, if anything, to a youth football club. It's the obligation that a professional club has towards a youngster if they take him on. Yeah. I would probably agree with that because, uh, you know, not being here the last time it was, it was discussed, I certainly believe that, you know, there's a serious question in this petition. Uh, you know, is it appropriate that you know that professional clubs should should enter into a contract with children under 16 years of age? And uh, so, yeah, I'm quite happy that we should bring in the commissioner and indeed, sort of, uh, maybe the SFA at a later date. Angus. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, I would agree. I think there's a strong argument to to invite the the commissioner in um, to address the committee. Um, with regard to David Torrance's point uh, regarding the members' debate, I, I don't think that will have any impact on the time scale because I believe the, the members' debate is next week. Next week. Um, so given, given the committee schedule, uh, it shouldn't cause a problem. But it would be good to see if there's any further information comes to light during the members' debate uh, before we uh, hear from the Commissioner. Any other comments? Questions? No, do we agree then that we'll invite the Commissioner and indeed the, maybe after the Commissioner we then put an offer for the SFA to attend? Agreed? Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Uh, the next petition is PE1480 by Amanda Capel on behalf of the Frank Capel Alzheimer's Awareness Campaign on Alzheimer's and Dementia Awareness. And members have a note by the clerk, and they can, can I invite a uh, contribution from members? Jackson. I'm really very disappointed with where we've now managed to get this petition to and rather found itself stuck. Um, we've heard from the Cabinet Secretary, in fact, I think we might have heard from both the Cabinet Secretary and our predecessor, I just fully recall, um, and I've read the latest letter, which seems to me incredibly carefully drafted to not really take matters forward one way or another. Uh, and in a sense, you know, it's two years coming up now since this petition was lodged with us. Um, Mr. Coppola has since died. Uh, we established that it was a relatively small number of people under the age of 65 affected by the issue. There seems to be widespread sympathy around the issue as well. I feel if the Scottish Government ultimately is not going to act, I'd just as soon know that as not, um, because I don't think really our best interests are served by simply having this thing in a permanent status of limbo. Now, I don't know whether that's best achieved by inviting the Cabinet Secretary back to establish it or whether a very direct letter is put to the Cabinet Secretary saying, well, you know, this is all fine and well, we understand that, um, but do you expect this timetable to resolve itself in early course? And you know, when do you expect Cabinet Secretary to come to a firm view about whether or not this care would be provided? Uh, because if not, I think it, it's better for us to know that and to, uh, to move on on that basis. But I'm open, you know, obviously interested to know what other yeah. members think. That's really what I want to know from the Cabinet Secretary. I don't know necessarily whether I need the Cabinet Secretary to come here if she's prepared to tell me in writing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a fair point from, from uh, uh, Jackson. I think 
probably a letter would be better. I mean, I think you know, evidence sessions are, you know, important. We shouldn't, you know, just use them if it's only going to be a simple, straightforward yes or no. And to some extent, given where we are in the kind of electoral political calendar, it seems to me that the best thing we can do is try and get out a commitment or otherwise. And it may be that it's simply not affordable or whatever. But uh, uh, I would certainly veer towards just a direct letter to say we really need to know. And if, you can't, if your position is you don't know yet, when will you know, rather than an evidence session that you know, we may want them in on more important, not, not to denigrate this issue, but on something where we want them for a longer opportunity as opposed to simply asking direct questions. So in that view, I'm, I'm more for the direct letter. I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure if we, can, if we can be any more direct than on the previous letter that we've written to the Cabinet Secretary because we've asked these very, very points that you've raised here and, and, uh, and I think everybody agrees that this, you know, the progression in this petition has been really, really slow. And, you know, the Cabinet Secretary, when she was here the last time, uh, had advised that she'd met with COSLA uh, to discuss this and, and that meeting has never really taken place to discuss this. So, I mean, I would, I, I would suggest that we get the Cabinet Secretary back in and then we can put these direct questions to her. And if at the end of the day she says, for whatever reason, we're not going to take this forward, then I think it's something we need to know. Fair enough. Would you agree with that, colleagues? I'm comfortable. Right, thank you very much, John. The next petition is PE1505 by Jackie Watt on awareness of Step B in pregnancy and infants. Members have a note by the clerk and its submissions. Can I invite contributions from members? Jackson. Uh, this is an interesting petition, but I think we could move to close it given that the uh, petitioner is going to be consulted and there's an undertaking to that effect by the government on the drafting of the new booklet that will offer advice. And I think that... Uh, is, a, is a helpful resolution of the issues concerned and one which allows us to bring the petition to a close. Members agree with Jackson? Yes. Okay, thank you. The next petition is PE 1531 by Ashley Husband Powtown on removing charitable status from private schools. Uh, again, members have a note by the clerk and submissions. Can I invite contributions from members? Uh, can I say that um, I've read carefully the responses we've received and uh, the issues raised by, particularly by Oscar. Uh, and the difficulty I have is that when you take the term independent schools, then Oscar have quite rightly said independent schools include special needs schools that are established by charitable status. And uh, Oscar make reference to Donaldson's, uh, the Royal Blind School and Capability Scotland schools. The difficulty is, is that, and I know that the independent education sector don't like the term private education in Scotland. They prefer the term independent. It's really trying to get to the point where we can have a clear examination and distinction between what is being provided in terms of the special needs provision as described by Oscar and what is being provided by the other sector within the independent schooling sector. Uh, and I would, and given Oscar's comments, I would be minded to write to the Scottish Government to ask the Scottish Government whether or not they would consider reviewing the 2005 uh, charities legislation to, with the, the mind to review and to either define uh, the, or make a better definition of what is charitable in terms of special needs and what is charitable in terms of, and I use the term, private education in Scotland. Uh, so we can get a clear steer from Oscar as to their definition of what is a charitable uh, status education provision within Scotland, because I, I do see uh, the difficulty is when we talk about independent schools, there are schools out there that are delivering what I would term clearly charitable aims and objectives and providing special needs. And then we have other schools that have charitable status uh, that get lumped in with that and get the, 
special provisions that are afforded to charitable status schools. Jackson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Can I can say that I continue to find the submissions of the petitioner sort of unhelpful and uh, not terribly well phrased or sympathetic. Um, I'm not also sure, sure that the distinction that Mr Wilson seeks to identify is one which is not understood by the government or by Oscar, but I have no particular objection to the question being put, but I do feel we're continually going around the houses and all of this when the Scottish Government have said it has no particular interest in or intention to uh, review the legislation in hand or the terms of reference of it, um, and so that, uh, as far as I can see, there is no political will to move the, petition, the aims of the petitioner forward. So, I mean, I'm happy for the question to be put that Mr Wilson has suggested, um, but with a view ultimately to us uh, closing the petition, since there seems no prospect of the Scottish Government acting on it. Okay. Members agree to Angus. Convener, um, there, there was, of course, some discussion earlier when, when the petition appeared before this committee that uh, it was regard to extending charitable status to state schools, um, in, uh, including uh, schools that have uh, um, uh, additional support need uh, children attending. Um, perhaps could, could that suggestion be included in the letter to the Scottish Government? Um, would that be within the, the given that it has been uh, discussed uh, previously in this committee? Yeah. We could add that to the letter we're going to write. Yeah? Members agreed? Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next petition is PE1545 by Anne Maxwell on behalf of the Muir Maxwell Trust on residential care provision for severely learned and disabled. Members have a note by the clerk and submissions. Can I invite contributions from members? Could I therefore agree that we should write to the uh, to seek further information and views from the Scottish Government, the Chief Social Work Advisor and Professor Sally Ann Cooper? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. The next petition is PE1548 by Beth Morrison on a national guidance on restraint and seclusion in schools. Again, members have a note with the clerk and the submissions. Can I invite contributions from members? I think there is an issue here in that we should be approaching both the government to ask it to respond to the concerns as well as raising it with the General Teaching Council as to uh, what guidance, criteria, etc. are available for uh, severely disabled children. It is an issue whether it's happening with regard to restraint by the police, whether it's happening with regard to restraint by children. I think we're in that kind of new world. I think we've got to try and get it right and therefore I think getting some understanding of where we're at as well as perhaps looking towards improving the guidance and guidelines would be appropriate. Can I comment particularly on the, the submission from the EIS? I was rather concerned uh, at some of the language used in the submission by the EIS, and it's, it's useful to get their submission. Uh, but they base, and the submission was based on uh, the, the, basically, uh, the annual general meeting in 2005 of the EIS where they took a policy decision. The reference to violent situations, I think, uh, does not accurately reflect what the petitioner is actually trying to raise within uh, the petition. Uh, the issue is about how restraint is used by teaching staff and other members of staff within the educational setting. Uh, and I really think in terms of they are right in that paragraph where they talk about violent situations, to talk about risk assessments. And it is something that uh, the petitioner has raised that, that not every child uh, who may be vulnerable in a school setting uh, is having the risk assessments carried out uh, and noted that may require uh, appropriate use of alternative methods, including restraint uh, for that child. 
Uh, and clearly there is an issue about, and the EIS do recognise, there is an issue about self-harm for the child. And that's hence the reason why it may result in restraint. But there is an issue clearly that the petitioners raised is about what type of restraint methods are being used and how that restraint is being carried out uh, and who is providing the training uh, for the staff. Because it's not just teaching staff, it should be all staff within an educational setting that includes janitorial staff, cleaning staff, as well as potentially catering staff should be aware of the needs of that child. So I would be keen uh, in relation to the petition to raise this further uh, with the General Teaching Council has been suggested, but also to raise it, flag it back up again in terms of the issues raised uh, by the petitioner to the Scottish Government, that uh, some of the issues that have been raised about the costs of providing the tra training and that uh, you know, individuals within a school setting are trained, uh, and that normally is the head teacher. But given that head teachers are not always in the school setting when the actions are required, then it would be useful to get some clear indication from the Scottish Government as to what advice uh, and or guidance is being given to local authorities uh, to then advise head teachers and other staff within the school setting about the appropriate methods of restraint when required. But, as I said, I would reinforce that with the risk assessment having to be notified and carried out uh, prior to that type of action being taken. But I think it, it would be worthwhile just flagging that up to the Scottish Government again, because clearly there are issues here about uh, the methods of restraint that are being used. Uh, and while EIS quite rightly identify the teaching staff may face uh, disciplinary action or uh, legal action uh, if they take inappropriate restraint methods, uh, which may lead to harm with the child, then clearly this is an, an issue of concern if we, are not have, we don't have a common approach uh, throughout the education service as to what is, would be the appropriate methods of restraint uh, when required. So uh, I think we can we agree to the point. Sorry, Jackson. Um, I, I notice that um, the petitioners receive very public support from, I think she's now Dame Esther Ranson, I hope I got that right, the protocol police within the Conservative Party, who there are many in Legion will correct me if I'm wrong on that, um, the public support. But I notice also the petitioners are hugely encouraged by the uh, quality and depth of the varied response that we've received. And I think in writing further to the Scottish Government, some of this would be of benefit um, more generally in terms of uh, the colour of the future response we might receive from them, and I'd like to see that that goes to them as well. Okay. Right, so members agreed then we'll write to the General Te Teaching Council for Scotland and to the Scottish Government with the points that have been raised by both John Wilson and Jackson Carlo. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. The final petition uh, today is PE1551 by Scott Patterson on mandatory reporting of child abuse. Uh, members have a note by the clerk and submissions. Can I invite some questions from members or, or contributions? I think this is a deeply complex issue, which is why, although I think we need a response from the Scottish Government for the 18th of March, we need to push them on that. I can understand why we need to make sure that they, and indeed ourselves, get it right. There are concerns about actions and then possible reactions, unintended consequences, but I think we need to try and make some progress here because as an underlying issue, we do need to chase the government to try and get some further update. Any other comment? Could I perhaps then just say that obviously there have been uh, several thoughtful and informative responses and it's now been over two months since the committee wrote and we have yet to receive a reply from the Scottish Government. And this is such a, an important matter and deserves a response. And uh, could I add that, uh, again, like the last petition, draw the attention to the submissions already received and the suggestions for a full public consultation, further debate and further research inviting the Scottish Government to comment, to comment on these in addition to our original request for reviews. Members agreed? Yeah, right. Thank you very much.
agenda, agenda item four is the annual report. Uh, the final item on the agenda day is consideration of the committee's draft annual report for the parliamentary year 11th of May 2014 to the 10th of May 2013. All committee annual reports follow a standard format as agreed by the conveners group. And members are invited to note the draft report, which paper 12 refers to, which will be published during the week 1st to 5th of June. Member John. Convener, a note from the draft annual report in front of us. We have no mention of what the remit of the committee is or the membership of the committee. Just been advised, John, that that will be included. Right, thank you. Any other questions? We agree that then. Yep. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, I now form the closing meeting.